Um, Kay Morrison, where's home? Home is Harlow, here in Essex. I've made my home here. I may not have been here all that long, relatively speaking, but I'm putting down roots right here. So take us back to a few years ago. Where are you originally from? Just a few years ago, really, not very long at all. I started off in life in a hospital in Ballycastle. Ballycastle is on the north coast of Northern Ireland, County Antrim. Uh, I'm not sure, I probably spent, spent a few days there. And my mother told me a long time afterwards that when one of the nurses was bathing me, she was singing that old song, I'll take you home again, Kathleen. And my mother said, the very thing, the very thing, that's what I'll call her, and proceeded to call me Kay from then on. And so you're, the town you, um, your early years brought up in was? Well, I started off in Ballycastle, but then was brought home to around about four, four and a half miles, maybe a bit more, outside Bushmills. Bush Mills. So I was brought up in a place called the Cranach, the Cranach, um, which means a haven, and in olden times, our Cranagh was, it was sometimes a single home, or it could have been several, often built out into a loch or lake, uh, a kind of dwelling place, but which offered strength and defence to the people who lived there. And sometimes there were animals within these homes and their fires would go up through the roof. So the Cranagh is probably an indication that there was something like that there but a long 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 time ago. So Bushmills, what's the population of Bushmills? I am I'm not too sure what it is now but it is not it's not terribly big. 10,000, 20,000? Probably I don't know let's say 20. 20 is probably not quite that but um, but the name will spring up to a lot of people. Bushmills whiskey, whiskey, <laughs> whiskey, whiskey. The oldest distillery in the world and that's only one of the things that makes Bushmills a bit of an attraction and fairly famous throughout the world actually. Uh, the, the Giant's Causeway is nearby. So how far is the Giant's attraction. Causeway from where you're going? It's only about a mile and a half, something like that. Yes. Well, a mile and a half from Bushmills. I'm now venturing out from Bushmills. But from where I live, from the Cranagh, probably, I don't know, three and a half, four. I'm a bit creative with distance. That's how we are in Northern Ireland. And so, um, for those who don't know, the Giant's Causeway, that's a World Heritage Site, isn't it? It so is, Can you describe it is. a little bit of that? It is, yes. It is very, very famous because of the rock formations, which are in steps, basalt columns, really quite spectacular. If you've never been there, you've got to go and have a look and have a walk around. You will see uh, various constructions, I suppose, they almost look like the Giant's Chair, all of that sort of thing. There's quite a distance, actually, walking around. And when you're finished, you can go into the centre, which is a very modern building, and spend a bit of money in the shop. So, back to, so sorry, just take us back. So the town in which you're, you were brought, like, so I've asked you what's your school. Yes. Which town was your school in? Yes, that's an interesting question. <laughs> I <laughs> started off. It's not going to be a straight one, is it? <laughs> no, 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 it's not going to be. You're talking to me now, Michael. Um, <laughs> started off attending Dunseverick, Dunseverick Primary School which was just across the road almost from where I lived, where my family lived. However, it was discovered after a couple of years that the school wasn't really delivering the quality of education at that time. At that time, I stress, it has changed considerably. It's a really, really good school now. But it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't doing a good job for its pupils. And my mother, who was a remarkable character, uh, went in and questioned the head teacher. It was a very small school, there was a head teacher and one other teacher. And they didn't give her satisfactory answers. So quite quickly then she removed her children, including me, from that school. And then we went to Bush Mills Primary School. So we're back in Bush Mills again, uh, which is uh, much, yes, it's, it's a good school. It's an impressive school. And I think I did OK there. Maybe I was a bit of a dreamer. I don't know. But I think I was OK. Fairly clever, I think. And senior school? What was the senior school called? Bush Mills Grammar School. Ah, so. So did you take the 11 plus and pass it? I did actually. I passed the 11 plus to my, so you're only to my astonishment. 
So we're interviewing two people from Northern Ireland in these 75 years. You both passed the 11 plus. What's that say about uh, <laughs> the brains in Northern Ireland? I don't know. I, I really don't know. I think I was just lucky. I was quite surprised. And uh, in my last year at the primary school, some of, <coughs> some of us were separated out from our class for a few hours each week. We had to attend special tutorials with the head teacher of the school who really put us through our paces and who wasn't very kind to one or two members of that group because they weren't coming up to his standard. However, I don't know if it was thanks to him or if it would have happened anyway, I managed to pass the exam and ended up in Bush Mills Grammar School, very, very old fashioned, or uh, almost a sort of stereotypical grammar school. It's no longer a grammar school incidentally. Um, and yeah, I did okay there. One or two of the teachers may be a little bit, a little bit stuck in the past. I thought that even then, but one or two others who were definitely doing an incredibly impressive job. Of course, I just loved the English teacher, and that is the teacher of the English language, language and literature, because that was the area that I favoured. Yeah. What was your favourite subject? English. English, English, yeah. <laughs> and do you remember any particular, you know, sometimes you're at school and you remember uh, books you were studying or plays you were studying, was there anything that comes out? Let's think, I, I don't know, we, I'm trying to remember, I, I don't know, it's all blurring together, mm. quite a lot of poetry. I have to admit that the teacher, the teacher to whom I've just referred, Mr. Binney was his name, and he was Scottish. He was passionate about his subject, but he did not have perfect sight, so he wore dark glasses all the time, and as a result, wasn't able to see what was happening at the back of the room. So sometimes, the less attentive pupils would be doing something else, really, wasn't not necessarily what they were supposed to be doing. And if we were maybe reading from a text, or had been asked to learn uh, a little bit by heart, they would sometimes have their book propped up against the person in front of them and Mr. Binney didn't see. Uh, I remember thinking then that was horrible, I was taking advantage of him, you know, but maybe he realised that some of that was happening, he was just a very gentle yet passionate very maybe slightly too indulgent very kind sort of a teacher but isn't it interesting that here we are speaking to you your counselor Kay Morrison yeah um, you're involved in the community here uh, even though you've been the counselor for a, a short time but that's for the politics page um, but you're also involved in being a counselor uh, in and a political representative in Scotland did you always you know, talk about Mr. Binney then, did you always have a bit of a sense of feel for the underdog or, or, or the community, is that something, or was it part of your family had that feeling? I think maybe that is true, yes, and probably if you were sufficiently interested, and most people probably aren't, you could do a bit of research into my family and you would find some of, some of the causes. Um, however, I ended up moving to Scotland, to Fife, because um, my husband had got a job there. And this is an old story, a really, really old story. Often partners end up moving elsewhere without necessarily planning it. By that stage, I was head of an English department, thank you, Mr. Binney, um, in a secondary school. So when we moved to Fife, I thought that maybe I should take a change of direction and so for a short time I did something that is quite unusual. I worked, I taught part-time in a secondary school and I taught part-time in a further education college. And I had the opportunity, I think uniquely probably because I spent two and a half days in one and two and a half days in the other, to find out, quite experimentally really, which one I should focus on for the rest of my teaching career and it turned out to be further education because I discovered that there's a lot more a lot more latitude, a lot more freedom. It's possible to develop courses if you see that there is a need and you can lead courses in a slightly different way. I should maybe point out now that I've been a trade unionist all my life. So when I started teaching I became the union rep. 
and that that just continued wherever I went really <coughs> always heavily involved in um, my trade union in Scotland it's the EIS the Educational Institute of Scotland and in further education I became much more involved because in Scotland I don't think this is political well it's political with a very small p <coughs> In further education colleges, um, well, further education colleges in Scotland lost national bargaining. And I think it was 1996, around about then. <clears throat> so they became corporate entities, which meant that every single college had, and still has to a large extent, to negotiate its own pay, its own conditions. So that's for all the staff who work in each college, teaching, support staff, janitors, cleaners, you name it. And so I became, um, well, more and more the chair of the branch. The college grew because it swallowed up one or two other colleges. This is quite common, I know. So quite often I would be presenting collective grievances or presenting our arguments for better pay, that sort of thing, to the board of college management. So again we're going to keep politics small p yeah. i guess in your time you've seen the, unions, the strength of the unions and the weakness of the unions but here we are again in july 2022 with the post office workers yeah. get balloting to go on strike and a lot of people threatening strike um so good or bad would you always continue to say to people the, impo the, 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 the importance of unions yes definitely and why i think every workplace should be unionized I understand that some employers and maybe people who aren't members of a trade union are nervous of trade unions and see them as a negative force. That does not have to be the case. If the, the trade union is operating well and the employer or board or whatever it happens to be is also doing the job well, they will see that it benefits everybody in an organisation to really work hard at building a positive, constructive, productive relationship. It benefits everybody. It's not them or us, it should be all of us. That's a healthy situation. I understand that's, that's not always the case, but there should always be a willingness to work towards that. So do you see the role, again, we're gonna still stay to the small p, but <laughs> the role as a counselor uh, is, is almost like a, a union rep as well. It is, yes it is, and I see myself as representing people who may not necessarily feel that they have a voice, that they have the ability or the strength or uh, the confidence to just step forward or stand up and say, excuse me, you know, this is not good enough, this needs to be tackled. And there are definitely one or two things in Harlow Council the way it does its work that need to be tackled. I think everybody would agree with that. That's just how it is. And who knows, maybe if it were otherwise I'd be disappointed. <laughs> I really like a challenge. But at the moment I'm concentrating on matters such as telecommunications mass. I've mentioned those before. But other things such as the environment, the uh, not just the built environment, the natural environment, trees, vegetation, all of that. That at the moment is taking up quite a lot of my time. There's a bit of a challenge there. I'm starting to pull you back from planning applications. Yeah, do. And oh, and planning applications. Yes, indeed. Uh, and 5G masking is raised. Back to when's the last time you went back to Northern Ireland? Ah, uh, because of the pandemic. Oh. It was right at the beginning of 2020. But I'm planning all being well to go over at the end of October which is it's half term here it's not half term in Northern Ireland unfortunately um, but uh, it suits my little family here in Essex so that's what we're going to go over for just about just a few days really but to see everybody again it's going to feel so strange and so wonderful I, I'm trying to subdue the level of joy I feel at just seeing my family again and have you travelled a lot within Northern Ireland. Have you been? Um, this may sound like a strange question, but have you travelled much? Have you been to Belfast, Stroke City, Derry, London, Derry? <laughs> um, 
Have you been across the border to been Dublin or Cork? Have you been around Ireland a lot? Yeah, well, I've been around, I wouldn't say a lot. Oddly, I've never been to Cork. I keep wanting to go to Cork and something always crops up. We're not able to go, we can't go. But I'll still go, definitely have to go there. But I've been to Galway, uh, Dublin, yeah, for quite a few years. In fact, I was at university in Dublin and uh, Derry started off my university career, career in Dublin, or uh, sorry, in Derry. Um, incidentally, the Derry thing, people tell you, <laughs> the media, it's, I know it's media, my daughter would be furious if she heard that pronunciation, mm -hmm. has been telling us for years that your choice of name for that particular city shows your political <laughs> affiliation. We didn't know that. Yeah. Everybody just called it Derry until suddenly somebody on television said, oh, um, by the way, if you call it Derry, this is how you align yourself. And if you call it London Dairy, it's otherwise. I decided I'm not going to be swayed by that. I just call it what I've always called it. And yes, been to Derry, Belfast, of course, yes. And I have family in Lisburn, which is really just outside Belfast. Quite a lot of family there now. So I'll be visiting them, but I'll definitely go back to the Cranach as well. And are you proud of your Irish history and your Irish heritage? You know, are you, are you, are you proud to be a woman, woman of Ireland? I am proud to be Northern Irish. Um, given the complexity of the history of that part of the world, um, and my family has not been untouched by that. Most families in Northern Ireland have felt it in some way and some of the effects are lasting. Nonetheless, it's where I started off and it's where a bit of my heart belongs. But I have discovered that it's possible to have more than one home. I started off there, I moved to Fife, spent uh, some time in a little town or village called Markinch, then moved to Glenrothes. And now here I am in Harlow, and I'm really pleased to be here. As I said earlier, I'm definitely putting down roots here. I've met some really fantastic people, one or two folk who are making a colossal difference to the lives, that is for the better, of their fellow human beings. And they're doing it just because they believe it's the right thing to do. And those people are inspirational. And I know that I'll meet more and more and more of those people and I'm looking forward to it.